Thank you. Welcome. Welcome into, uh, welcome into worship today. Um, so glad to have folks here, have folks on Zoom. Uh, know that this is the start of the travel season. We've got, uh, there, there are, today represents a lot of things, uh, more than we can adequately make room for. Um, it's Juneteenth today, and that is a celebratory day. Uh, there's huge, huge block party events uh, right in my neighborhood yesterday, which is pretty exciting. It's Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to our fathers. Um, we're recognizing uh, at least one graduate who will be with us in person today, so glad to have him here. Uh, and, uh, and, and worship. It's, uh, it's worship. So welcome. We, we uh, remind ourselves when we, when we gather here that we are uh, not the original stewards of this land. We are on land that was stewarded by the Lenape people, and we commit ourselves to honoring these sacred lands. Um, to reminders, because we, we, particularly in the sanctuary, we're still getting back into, into our habits of uh, remembering who everyone is. So we do have name tags. Some folks have name tags hanging up. Some folks have misplaced their name tags that were hanging up. <laughs> uh, there are, uh, but there's always uh, materials out there to make your, to make a name tag so we can, uh, folks can remember who, who we are when we're here with one another. Uh, in the sanctuary here as well, if, if we have kids, Nate, you're, you're welcome. There's a craft table here if, uh, if you need to do some crafts. Uh, adults, you're welcome to make some crafts as well. We've also got these rugs here that I, I know were, were meant to add some color for our pride rainbows, but if anybody needs playtime, um, you feel free to make use of uh, the rugs for playtime. Uh, be before we begin our, uh, before we turn to our first song, uh, I just want to note for the opening sentences, I would love to have uh, a read. If someone here would be willing to be on microphone to read the leader part, uh, and if, if there's a volunteer on Zoom, can, can someone put their hand up on Zoom to, to read the people responses for our opening sentences when we get there? Okay, okay, Karen, Karen will do the, you'll, you'll do the leader, but we're going we're gonna to sing the hymn first. I just want to make sure we're good. So Karen will read the leader part. And is, is there someone, who will, someone on Zoom who will read the people lines for us when we get there? Becky, Becky will do it. I, I see Becky doing it. All right, thank you. Then I, I uh, invite you to, uh, to stand in body or spirit or to watch for the slides coming up as we sing together. Um, spirit, spirit of gentleness, which if you're using the hymnals, it's 286 in the black hymnal.
seated and Karen will read the leader lines for our opening sentences and I invite everyone uh, to follow Becky's lead uh, in hearing the people's lines. Let these words lay themselves like a blessing upon your head, your shoulders. As if they could anoint you not merely for the path ahead, Open, opens itself like another hand that unfurls itself. You may think this blessing lives within these words. It lives in the ache where this blessing begins. Amen. And our act of praise is, uh, again, number 443 in the black hymnals, and it will be up on the screen. us 
going to make you sit on the stage with me unless you would really, I, I got a clear no thank you there. I'm, I, and I, I'm looking on the screen, are there any kids that we've got on Zoom with us today? It doesn't look like it. Uh, okay. Uh, Emery, I think you might be the youngest person. I, I'd invite you to the stage. But I, <laughs> um, Thank you all. So I will I'll remind us that, you know, kids are part of our community. One thing that I was going to do with them, again, because there, is just, there are way too many things to, uh, to think about today. So I, I was going to do something a little fun. Uh, we're, we have a, a Bible reading today that, that will require some loud noises. And I was going to see if we could come up with those noises. Um, it, it, the three types of noise are a, t a tornado of wind, an earthquake, and a raging fire. So I, I wonder if maybe in the, if we can, if we can, okay, can we start, can we start with what's, what's the sound, what's the sound for the tornado win of wind? <laughs> Folks on Zoom, you're also welcome to make noise as you like. Okay. Awesome. All right. Great, thank you. What about the earthquake? That's, that seemed the obvious one as well. <laughs> um, and the, the, harder one, the harder one for me to think of was, uh, what's the sound of a, a, a roaring fire? <laughs> Becky Jamros is genius. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll try them just again. The, tor the tornado. The earthquake. And the fire. And we'll try not to do anything that requires reading the bulletins after this part of this. <laughs> um, all right, great, thank you. That is, that, that is our, our time with children today. Uh, <laughs> look how youthful we all are today. Um, so I, just some announcements, things that will, uh, will be in the bulletin and up on the screen as well. Let me start with what's tucked in the, in the bulletins for, for those of us who are, are here. Just a reminder that we're taking care of each other while we're still living in a pandemic. Um, visitor card, if we have visitors, you can feel free to fill that out. Let us know what you'd like to know about us and how, uh, uh, what you would like us to know about you. And a prayer request card, if there's something you want pastors to be praying for, you can fill that out and put it in the offering bowls later. Um, and up on the screen, the, and the things that are in, in your bulletin, we thank our worship volunteers, our worship team this morning, Terry Roberts on tech, Rachel Walton doing the camera work, um, Care Mesner is our online usher for the day, will we'll help with, the, um, with uh, facilitating the prayer time and 
um, making sure our settings are changed so people can unmute, etc. Um, Becky Jamros and Jack Vandenberg are helping out. They were our online greeters for today. Eli was stationed at the door to welcome you all as you got here. Uh, and then Jay Kaiser and Ruth Benedict will be our, our money counters today. Um, so we thank you all for doing what you do. Um, next Sunday, June 26th, our worship time moves to 10 a.m. for the summer. So if you show up at 11 o'clock, um, you'll get here just in time for the congregational meeting. Uh, our annual congregational meeting will happen after worship next Sunday. Uh, so we, uh, we, we um, would love for you to be here. Please do plan to attend that. We will vote on a leadership slate. And just a, a note about voting. Uh, voting is, um, is uh, restricted. This is the one, one time in our church life that voting is restricted to people who are, uh, or that we do voting, uh, and it is restricted to people who are uh, members of the congregation. But we will need to approve a budget and a leadership slate uh, for the year. Um, if you're planning summer travels, just a reminder, I always forget this reminder myself, but a reminder to gather water from the places that you're going, or you can bring representative water for our, uh, our second Sunday of September Water Sunday service, where we will share the stuff of our travels, and that will be our baptismal water for the year. Um, we are looking for help to uh, for folks to help with all of these aspects of, of worship leading the tech camera usher greeting uh, uh, helping to count the money uh, and uh, doing um, yes all of those things uh, if there are other ways that you would like to serve we are always looking for people to uh, to help out with various roles uh, at our congregational meeting next week, we will be voting on certain positions, um, and some of the, a couple of them that we've got open, we need a secretary for our church council, if, uh, and we can take self-nominations, or you can nominate someone else, but they have to consent to it. Um, so a secretary, we, uh, we could use someone to chair our stewardship committee, and the, the committees we vote on in, in total are our staff parish relations, which is like, uh, um, like the HR committee, uh, the trustees who attend to property, our nominating committee, which is the group of people who have been uh, trying, to, trying to match up folks and their gifts and interests with the ways that we can serve here. Um, so uh, any three of those committees also always need help. Uh, if you have questions or comments for church council, you can reach them at the email address that is listed there. And uh, folks who are not here in person with prayer request cards, you can uh, email prayer requests to prayers at chestnuthillunited.org. Um, you can e email them too. You don't have to use the, uh, the, the physical card. Are there other, oh, the, um, and we've got a slide that, um, of events for Pride Month. We've been focusing, we've had some Pride Month focus all, all month long. Um, there are a couple of events still listed here. The, tw uh, the 25th, which is next Saturday, there is a something at the zoo. I'm not as, my eyes is not as good as I was promoting earlier. <laughs> it's a zoo pride day. Um, and then on Sunday, uh, again, we'll, we will be having a panel discussion in church. Um, folks who are LGBTQ here are, are volunteering to be on a panel and talk about some of their experiences. Okay. Um, and I think that is all the announcements, unless anyone else has another announcement. Right. Well then, as, as part of Pride Month, we've been having a Pride Spotlight each week, and this week uh, we've got a video from Shannon Kearns, who was actually a guest speaker for us a few months ago, uh, and so we'll turn our attention to Shannon Kearns talking about uh, the Bible. In the before times, I took a trip to the Minneapolis Institute of Art. I love this museum for several reasons. It's always free, it's close enough to my house that I can walk there, and the collection is interesting. I wandered upstairs into the religious art section. I'm a sucker for the religious art. And there, among the creepy baby Jesuses and the Renaissance paintings, I had a bit of an epiphany. 
But first, let me back up. One of the main criticisms of queer theology, other than that it's excusing sin, which, hello, American evangelicalism, and they're ignoring a verses about wealth and the poor, is that queer theologians are simply making Jesus or God in their own image. It's a critique that's also been lobbied against feminist theologians, black theologians, anyone who does theology from their own context. Well, mostly anyone. The epiphany that I had in the midst of the art section is this. People have always been creating art and theology that depicts Jesus in their own image. They've been doing it since the beginning of the church. I mean, come on, have you seen the paintings of Mary and Jesus decked out in crowns and Renaissance robes? The paintings of Jesus with an Italian village in the background. The disciples dressed like people from the medieval era. This stuff is all over art. And don't even get me started on the legions of white Jesuses with blonde hair and blue eyes. I mean, we know Jesus wasn't white and blonde, right? To be frank, those of us who are white and American should see ourselves reflected in the Romans instead of in Jesus and his followers. We're the occupiers who are oppressing black and brown bodies. But we make art with Jesus looking like the artist because we're trying to make a point that Jesus can be identified with, that Jesus knew what it was like to be human, that we can put ourselves into the scene and choose to be a Jesus follower. Now here's where we get to the tricky part. It seems that no one cares that the artist has made Jesus to look like himself and his surroundings until that artist isn't a cisgender straight white man. But the second the artist is a black man who creates a painting of Mary as a black mother with Jesus lying bleeding in her arms, then it's a political statement and he's distorting the gospel. Or a gay man who envisions the passion narrative as speaking to the gay experience. Or a woman who talks about the feminine nature of Jesus. Even in my own transgender passion narrative, I never claimed that Jesus was transgender. I simply said that we can see some of the transgender experience within and through Jesus' passion. And yet, I have been accused of belittling the story of Jesus, of making myself too important, and on and on. And yet, those same critiques are never leveled at straight, white, cisgender men. Why? We only hate contextual theology when it's not written by straight, white, cisgender men because we still don't see them as having their own context. Straight, white, cisgender is the default. Anyone else is twisting scripture and trying to change the image of God. Well, what does that say about the image of God? Oh, we know what it says, that God is a white, cis, straight man. We know that representation in art matters. We know that it matters that we are able to see ourselves on screens and on pages and on stages. We know that the images that we have of God affect our theology at the deepest levels. It's just so tiring that people won't be honest with their outrage. The reason people are upset that I wrote a transgender passion narrative is because they don't like transgender people and they don't want to see us writing theology. The reason people hate that painting of Jesus as a black man is because they don't want to admit that they're a racist who doesn't want to follow a black savior. The reason people think that the only valid theology is by straight, white, cisgender people is because people think that only straight, white, cisgender people can speak with authority. Instead of being angry that people are doing theology from their own context, let's name that every theology has a context. No theology comes from nothing. It's vital that we name the context that we are writing from so that we no longer equate white, straight, cisgender as the default. Not in our theology, not in our images of God, and not in our world. Amen. Thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, so that, that was almost, I suppose, our first, first reading. Uh, or our pride spotlight. So our first reading this morning is a, a poem that moved me deeply uh, when I read it a couple of months ago. It seemed like a fine week to share it. It's called Self-Compassion by the poet James Cruz. Uh, this is what he says. Self-Compassion. 
My friend and I snickered the first time we heard the meditation teacher, a grown man, call himself Honey, with a hand placed over his heart to illustrate how we too might become more gentle with ourselves and our runaway minds. It's been years since we sat with legs twisted on cushions holding back our laughter, but today I found myself crouched on the floor again, not meditating exactly, just agreeing to be still, saying honey to myself each time I thought about my husband splayed on the couch with aching joints and fever from a tick bite. What if he never gets better? or considered the threat of more wildfires, the possible collapse of the Gulf Stream, then remembered that in a few more minutes, I'd have to climb down to the cellar and empty the bucket I placed beneath a leaky pipe that can't be fixed until next week. How long do any of us really have before the body begins to break down and empty its mysteries into the air? Oh, honey, I said. For once, without a trace of irony or blush of shame, the touch of my own hand on my chest like that of a stranger, oddly comforting, in spite of the facts. I'm very drawn to that comfort in spite of the facts. The Bible reading, the assigned Bible reading from the Hebrew Scriptures today, uh, comes from the first book of Kings. It's a little bit of a long story, and it comes with some uh, very complicated context. It, it mentions uh, what happened just prior, which was, well, you know, we wrestle with the violence of the scriptures. So the, the story before this, if you know the story of Elijah, is where he was in a showdown with the prophets of Baal, um, who, who were uh, propping up and supported by the corrupt rulers of Israel. Uh, it ends, that story ends with a lot of death. So we wrestle with the violence of the scriptures. Uh, it started with a lot of death in that the rulers of Israel at that time were also murdering the, um, the prophets of the Hebrew God Yahweh. Um, a lot of, there is some, some pretty good biblical scholarship, if you want to dig into it, that suggests that the, um, the, the God Yahweh, the monotheistic God, was also uh, paired with social egalitarianism. The, the God of, of peasants, agrarian peasants, uh, who were uh, actually fighting to keep their land, and that the, the god Baal was supporting, um, well, was, was, uh, was favored by, uh, by uh, kings and queens who wanted to be able to take land freely from those peasants. So there's an economic struggle that is, uh, that is kind of hidden inside the scriptures, according to some scholars, at least. So I, I just leave, leave the knowledge of the, the bloodiness of that story there. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh, and the, the king and queen are Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with a sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he was afraid, got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. So he's gone over the border. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. He said, oh, Lord, it is enough. Take away my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. But suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up, take and eat. He looked and there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again, went to sleep. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. And he got up and ate and drank. Then he went on the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. At that place he came to the cave and spent the night there. Then the word of God came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They're seeking my life to take it away. And 
God said, go, and, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Sorry, the angel said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was, here we go, now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in that wind. After the wind came an earthquake. <laughs> and after the earthquake, a fire. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire. Uh, after the fire, there came a sound of sheer silence. Ooh, you're good. Uh, when, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his, mount, in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. So same thing he said said elsewhere. So it's a little confusing as to what the whole purpose of the journey was, uh, but it's an interesting one. And then, then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, you can anoint a new king. In the face of hopelessness, do the, do the work, the, the long work of politics might be one message that comes from it. Uh, but I, I'm going to sit with it in a different way, I think. In, uh, in 1947, the jazz drummer David Toe uh, made a joke that he was writing a play about music. Uh, he said uh, about his play, so this is what it, what it is. A string quartet is playing the most advanced music ever written. It's made up entirely of rests, part where nobody plays. Mm -hmm. Uh, suddenly the viola man jumps up and in a rage and shakes his bow at the first violin and says, Lout! He screams it. You played that last measure wrong. Uh, just a few years later, that joke kind of became a reality, though it was carried out on solo piano rather than with a string quartet. An auditorium's worth of people um, had assembled. They paid tickets to get into the Maverick Concert Hall in Woodstock, New York, uh, August 29th, 1952, for a recital of contemporary piano music. On the bill that night was David Tudor, who was to present the world premiere of John Cage's piece, 4.33, or 4 minutes and 33 seconds. It was billed as a composition in three movements. I, I see a lot of you are nodding your head. Everybody knows the story already, but this is the one that called to me this week. Um, when it came time for Tudor to perform uh, Cage's composition, he sat down at the piano. Presumably, the audience was rapt. Uh, their attention was focused on this, uh, this new pr premiere, the anticipation. And so David Tudor began the piece by closing the piano lid and letting it sit there for 30 seconds. And then he opened it to show that it was a new movement. And he closed it for another 2 minutes and 23 seconds. And then he opened it once again. And then the third movement, he closed the piano lid for another minute and 40 seconds. And then opened it again. The world premiere of the piece was complete. He'd played three movements. Uh, each of them without a single note struck on the piano. It feels underwhelming. It feels maybe like a practical joke, but maybe we can take seriously the intention behind it. It was a serious intention. John Cage had come up with the idea several years before, uh, but he didn't do anything with it at the time because he thought it would be, what he said, incomprehensible in the Western context. He says, I didn't wish it to appear even to me as something easy to do or as a joke. I wanted to mean it utterly and be able to live with it. I'm not sure how opening and closing the lid of the piano can be made to seem difficult. But, uh, I mean, so we, we could easily suggest ha Jaime is improvising on... <laughs> 433, the whole time while I'm speaking here. Jaime, thank you for this accompaniment. This is, this is fantastic. 
Um, I guess maybe it, it would be difficult to walk out in front of a crowd of people expecting you to do something and close the lid of the piano. The difficulty of risk, uh, knowing those people had paid their money to, to be there uh, watching you play the piano rather than not play it. But the setup of the thing, that was the point. John Cage was trying to illustrate that there is a kind of music around us all the time, that life itself is a music. And to his mind, the setup of a concert hall heightened people's expectations and attentiveness. And then upending that expectation was meant to get those people to think about what they were paying attention to and what really counted. The year before he premiered that piece, he had gone to the Anechoic Chamber at Harvard University. Anechoic means simply without echo. Um, it was a room designed so that the walls and the ceiling and the floor absorbed all of the sounds, any sound made inside the room. And it's soundproof from the outside as well. So it's supposed to be uh, something that envelops you in sheer silence. But when he wrote about it later, he said, I heard two sounds, one high and one low. When I described them to the engineer in charge, he informed me that the high one was my nervous system in operation. The low one was my blood in circulation. Life itself is music. That was the point. A lot of people didn't take very kindly to, uh, to this premiere. Some of them started talking. Some of them got up and left. People thought it was a bad joke, and you can understand why. Because again, if I had paid money to hear someone play the piano, I'd be annoyed if their world premiere was to not play the piano, but they were tricking me into paying to listen to the ambient sound inside of an auditorium. I understand the annoyance. But when John Cage reflected later on the premiere of this event, this is what he said. He said, they missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering on the roof. And during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. Life is music. There's something valuable in the silence, which is never actually fully silent, which holds the capacity for surprise and nuance and insight, or as today's Bible reading would have us see, it holds the voice of God. We can say again that the the context of all of the story was very complicated, but it features Elijah, the prophet of God, on the run for his life after receiving death threats. Twice we hear ambivalence that sounds pretty much like a deep depression. Uh, he, on the one hand, is running for his life, but then twice says, it's too much now, just let me die. Um, there's a real ambivalence there. The action is he crosses the border to safety and the safety of a different country, uh, but then goes on for another day in the wilderness where he falls asleep and uh, an angel wakes him up to feed him twice uh, and send him on a 40-day and 40-night journey to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, what we, uh, what we might mistake, where he goes, hides in a cave. What we might mistake in the story, uh, because it's not our context, is that uh, all of the signs in this are pointing to this being the same cave uh, that the book of Exodus says Moses encountered God from. And it's here at this cave that Elijah does indeed encounter God. From inside that cave, we, we made our sound effects, heard the tornado of wind, and stays inside, uh, which seems wise. <laughs> cave is the best place to be. And then feels the earth shake beneath him and stays inside again, stays inside as the fire comes blazing through. Uh, it says God was not in any of those. And that's exactly where a million Christian sermons go a little bit off the rails uh, because they assume that means that God is never to be found in these dramatic moments 
uh, and then they prescribe silent prayer and meditation as the real, true way to get in touch with God. And you know what? That works for me, but introverts probably shouldn't be the model for everyone else's spiritual journey. Uh, and the fact of the matter is the Bible has plenty of stories of God being in those very elements. I mean, while I was on vacation, didn't Pentecost blow through with a rush of wind and some flames of fire? Uh, but this is a story of silence, silence in a world that has a lot of upsetting noise. Um, or it's something like silence. It says Elijah heard the wind, the earthquake, the fire. God was not in any of them, but then heard a sound that's variably translated as a whisper, a still small voice, sheer silence, or a sound of silence. And now a lot of you will be humming Simon and Garfunkel for the rest of the day. Uh, hello, darkness, my old friend. Sorry, not sorry. Um, the Hebrew Bible scholar Terence Fretheim says, uh, of this. He says, after all the activity and noise, for everything suddenly to become silent is an astonishing moment of sound. The sound of no sound in the immediate wake of loud sounds. And the silence, though, is not truly silent. God is in the silence. Life is a kind of music, and we're invited to pay attention for the hum of spirit that cuts through the sound and the silence, to know the spirit in all its guises, in all circumstances. In 2015, the historian Kate Bowler, who teaches at Duke University Divinity School, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. She was 35, married, mother of a young child. When she got her diagnosis, everyone thought that she would live maybe another year. That was the best information possible. She's been lucky and so far is still alive um, almost seven years later. And she's uh, keenly aware, more keenly aware of life's fragility and uncertainty than many of us are. Early in that diagnosis, she went into a surgery that was going to have an un unknown uh, effectiveness um, they opened up her torso in the surgery uh, and sewed her back shut. And she said when she woke up from it, uh, feeling all of, the, the, uh, all of the interference that had happened, really, with her torso, um, she felt like her body was no good anymore, like it had become something disposable. And she talks about this moment in her hospital bed uh, as a moment when the presence of God came into sharp focus. So, because while she was lying there in that bed, pastors and professors from the divinity school showed up uh, and they laid their hands on her head and on her shoulders. Maybe one of them said, oh honey, I don't know. Um, but they, they blessed her, they offered prayer over her. And she said she felt in that an intense, feeling of love. She, she says about that, God sometimes gives us these moments of supernatural closeness, and it is often directly correlated with our times of greatest suffering. In the silence, a presence. In the presence, an even, an even deeper presence. In hopelessness, the insistent tug of spirit. I wonder if we can take a moment this morning to heed John Cage's and the Bible's and Kate Bowler's invitations to attention, to noticing the sound of life and the presence of spirit. Don't worry, I'm not going to make it last for four minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, but, but we live enveloped in so much noise, so much of it troubling these days. And I, I wonder if maybe just for one minute we can sit in the quiet, the near silence, and listen to the music of life, whatever catches your attention, be it the traffic or the breeze or the sound of your own thoughts. Um, notice, notice it. Notice what it might be calling out to you. I invite you to pay attention to whatever is there, knowing that the Spirit hums through it.
And that is God's good news. Amen. Our, our first, our first, before we turn to the rest of our prayers, I want to do a prayer of celebration. Um, can I invite you out to the middle? Nate, you are one graduate who is here, unless we have others who are on Zoom with us, um, which I'm not seeing any right now. Um, you're, you're perfect right, right there. Can we have the, is the microphone around again somewhere? So I want, I want to notice we are, we are celebrating graduates and transitions. We have, we have a number of, of, uh, of, st of students who are making transitions, or who have made transitions at this point. We heard about some of them last week. Juniper uh, C. Spinlayson just finished kindergarten uh, and sadly missed her graduation because of COVID. But we are lifting her up this morning to celebrate that transition. Eli Critch. Um, finished fourth grade, but is in a school district, which means he's headed to middle school next year. So a new school for Eli Critch. Nick, can you tell us what you finished up and where you're headed? Uh, I just graduated eighth grade. I'm going to Central High School next year. Central High School. All right. We have a number of Central High School grads who, uh, who have been part of this church. Thank you. Uh, can you, can you ha still hang out here for just a second? <laughs> I, I, um, it, it, it's, it's a... It's, staring at you and making you feel awkward is part of our graduation <laughs> celebration for you. Um, Alden Code Doyle is uh, on a rock climbing trip for the next couple of weeks, I think, but he just graduated high school, Abington Friends High School, and is headed to college in California next year. Um, speak, and speaking of California, Lindsay, Lindsay Klink is leaving, I think, today uh, for a couple of weeks with Patty in uh, Italy. So happy graduation to her. She just graduated from, I believe, University of California in San Diego. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong about that. And John Guest, I'm not sure if John Guest is here. John Guest, there was some possibility he was going to be, but uh, I think I don't see him online. He just graduated from parents. Can, can you, you want to tell us the University of Maryland with his PhD in? Things that nobody under immun, immunology and computational biology. biology. Thank you. So, yeah, we can la applause. Sounds of earthquakes and tornadoes. <laughs> but since you are here and we're already making you feel awkward, um, <laughs> I, I would love to say a prayer for you. Is it okay if I come here and put my hands on your shoulders? All right, thank you. Can we, can we offer up a prayer for Nate? We are so amazed that Nate has grown twice in size over the pandemic. We are grateful for all that he has done to make it through eighth grade to get himself into Central High School. Oh, Spirit, we are grateful for all that lies ahead of him, for the challenges, for the things he will learn, for the ways that he will continue becoming the young person he is becoming. We are excited to watch as Nate grows into adulthood. We, uh, we ask your blessing and your constant presence with him. Amen. Thank you for enduring that. You can, you. And carry me, Spirit of the wind, carry me home, Spirit of the wind, carry me home to myself. Spirit of the wind, carry me, Spirit of the We continue our worship through the presentation of our gifts and offerings. For those of you here, you can bring offerings to the bowls. You can also bring prayer requests uh, or other information cards if you want to make sure that we get those and drop them in the bowl. Uh, and those of you online will get the, uh, the, the link for online giving in the chat if you want to use that at this time. Uh, and Jaime has an offertory for us.
And I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing our offering response. Hale, hale, hale. Simple words. It's okay. It's number one. Sanctuary number 30, Waken Your Song, and up on the screens. Uh, if you like to sing the whole thing. place into whatever the day holds, paying attention for the music of life, however it shows out. up. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>